Okay, uh, members, uh, welcome to the Staffordshire Police Fire and Crime Panel. Today is the Monday, the 25th of April. Um, I am uh, Councillor Richard Cox, Vice Chair uh, of the committee, uh, the panel, uh, in the absence of uh, the Chairman, um, Councillor Peters, uh, who's unfortunately not well enough to uh, attend, but we send him our best wishes uh, at home. Um, if I may go to the uh, agenda, uh, could we have uh, number one, apologies please? I've received apologies from the Chairman, Councillor Peters. Thank you, and I think otherwise we are all present, so thank you for your attendance. Uh, number two, declarations of interest. Do uh, any members have any declarations to declare? And I think it's right to say that if anything does come to mind as the meeting progresses, please uh, uh, let me know, and we will uh, duly note those declarations if they come to mind. Uh, three uh, minutes of the meeting held on the 14th of February 2022. And Councillor Holmes, uh, may I thank you for your um, chairing that meeting in the absence of myself and uh, Councillor Peters. Uh, COVID got the better of us and uh, Councillor Holmes uh, duly stepped into to the role and I thank you for that. Um, so in terms of the uh, minutes, uh, are we approving that they are an accurate record? Thank you very much. And item four is the confirmation hearing uh, for the Chief Executive of the um, Commissioner's Office. Um, so uh, I open it up. There's a consideration with the proposed appointment in the position of Chief Executive in the Office of the Police, Fire and Crime C Commissioner. Over to you, sir. Good morning. Morning, Vice Chair. Morning, everybody. Um, this is a very pleasant item to uh, introduce to you. Um, to my left, Louise Clayton, who has come through a very rigorous process of uh, application and interview. Um, you can see there in the, uh, in the paper around this that the job of uh, the Chief Exec of the Commissioner's Office is quite a wide-reaching and substantial one. Um, it isn't a nine-to-five job. It, is, uh, it demands creativity. It demands, um, I think, the highest quality of leadership and partnership working. And it also means listening to me wittering on at all hours of the day and weekends and things like that in order to progress the business uh, which I'm about, which is really primarily to deliver my uh, police and crime and fire and rescue plans. And it is very much with that in mind that um, I set out to find a chief executive who could really demonstrate a capacity to build new relationships, to work with a wide range of partners. Uh, as you'll know, panel, we've got uh, very close relationships with various organisations in the criminal justice system, uh, with councils, with the third sector, with volunteers, charities, community groups. Um, it's really key that we have strong relationships with them because we can't deliver what we want in terms of community safety without their support. We deliver a lot of what we do with them. Um, I also needed somebody who had demonstrated that they could manage a team and had the respect of their teams, uh, which I believe Louise has done. Um, in this sort of world, not necessarily specifically in, in community safety, I think maybe 12 months ago I might have felt slightly different about that, but the um, way in which Helen and I have been introduced to the office, uh, I think I'd, I'm likely to be a bit more uh, knowledgeable, I think, than, than many people I've met on, on community safety now within. And that was the case within months in. So the key thing is somebody who can manage and support a team of experts. 
We've got great experience, got great talent in the, uh, in the organisation already. And I was looking for somebody who could uh, build on those talents, help people do even better, and then pull together to deliver around my uh, plan expectations. Some of the job is tricky in the sense that it is, um, I guess, not glamorous. There's em employment issues, particularly in the fire service, where I'm the employer at the moment. There's the um, holding to account, which can be stressful. It means a real mix of uh, diplomacy and um, capacity to stand firm in some situations to get to where we need to get to. Uh, so it's a, it's a wide ranging and um, challenging job. One which needs somebody with great uh, ambition uh, to do well in everything that they've done before. And there's some new areas of work that I want to develop, as you'll know. I've talked about a wider um, garnering of opinion from the public. I'd like the plans going forward to stay with what the public think is important. And uh, I'm particularly interested in really getting to understand the um, opinion and concerns and worries of young people. I think we've got to, um, if we're going to make progress in, in, in particularly offenders uh, looking after victims, we've got to work with the vulnerable. And that takes us into some new places. And then fundamentally, we are constantly and never-endingly delivering projects. So it was fundamental that uh, the person, uh, not, not my right hand today, my left hand, but my uh, right hand person in addition to my deputy, um, was very much about getting things done, uh, action-oriented, and looked at a mix of proven and uh, potentially new creative ways of getting projects delivered. So I'm hoping you'll find uh, your opportunity to have a chat with Louise will be as um, rewarding and pleasant as mine was during the process. And uh, I believe she is willing to uh, have a chat with you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you um, for, for that. And uh, Louise, uh, your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, it's a very exciting opportunity. Um, also a little nerve-wracking. Um, if I can just tell you a little bit about myself as a person and my work experience over the last 30 years, um, and then we'll welcome any questions that you may have. So I've lived in Staffordshire since 1997. Um, I'm married and I have five children, um, three of my own and two stepchildren. So we're quite a large house. We're been known as the Von Traps for many years. Um, taking seven people anywhere is quite challenging. Um, and I joined Staffordshire County Council 18 years ago. And I joined the road safety team, actually. That was my first role, uh, working with communities um, to encourage safer travel around schools, so to make um, communities and school areas safer. And I didn't think I'd be staying with Staffordshire quite so long, but it's been a fantastic, um, oh, I've had fantastic opportunities working with Staffordshire. And over the last 12 years, I've held a senior leadership role within the organization, working within the connectivity and sustainability area. Um, my current role is head of transport operations and future connectivity. And as part of that, I manage a team of around 70 people with budget responsibility of more than 30 million pounds a year managing an, a range of services, um, commission services, statutory and regulated services, multi-million pound externally funded projects, um, including Air Aware to improve the air quality for residents of Staffordshire, um, our demand responsive transport service up in the Staffordshire Moorlands, um, and also working very closely with all of our bus operators to develop one of our most ambitious plans to date, um, looking to improve local bus services in the county. Um, so I, I've had an opportunity to work on lots of areas. Um, it's not only project management, though. I also work on developing strategies for new and emerging gen agendas, including, for example, electric vehicle infrastructure, um, and working um, to look at decarbonisation of transport across uh, Staffordshire. Um, and as well as that, responding to changes in legislation. That's a key part of my role, especially within the statutory services, which I manage, uh, manage uh, which is basically the home to school transport network. 
So making sure that 8,000 children um, can travel to and from school safely every single day. So my portfolio at the moment is very diverse. As part of that, I work really closely with three cabinet members, regularly attend informal cabinet and scrutiny meetings, provide the expert advice needed to make their informed decisions and support them in whatever way or shape is necessary. More recently, I've completed a master's in business administration at Keele University. I was very lucky to be one of the, the first apprentice, apprentices to go through the apprenticeship agenda with Staffordshire County Council. Um, and I graduate this week actually up at Keele University. And I share that because the last three years I've been um, fascinating, um, managing a very, very complex service, leading it through the pandemic, responding to all of those challenges, making sure that critical services are maintained throughout that period, as well as developing recovery strategies and looking at what the future might um, look like post COVID. Um, and at the same time, I'm studying for my MBA. So the skills that I've learned um, through the MBA um, have really enhanced my professional growth and development, but more importantly, it's taught me a lot about myself it's taught me about my strengths, my weaknesses, what makes me tick. And I think one of the things I have learned about myself is my resilience. Um, and I think that's carried me and my service through the last couple of years. And I think resilience is probably something that will be needed for this role going forward. I also um, enjoy change. I thrive on change. I'm always looking for change, driving innovation, looking for transformation. And I think that will be critical to the role going forward too. Um, so I think that's a little bit about me, a little bit about my work background and experience, but happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Louise. Uh, very interesting. And uh, we've got one or two questions. Um, Phil Hudson. Oh, good morning, Louise. I'm Councillor Phil Hudson from East Staffordshire Borough Council. I know that the Commissioner is very keen that there have to be changes in the way in which we police Staffordshire over the next few years. And I know that the Chief Constable is as well. And bearing in light of the recent reports that we've had, what is your experience of managing change and how do you see that being useful in this role? Thank you. Um, over the last 18 years, every role that I've had includes an element of managing change but more recently um, managing change culture change has been a big part so for example taking our commercial bus operators on a journey along with our politicians and our cabinet members has been contentious at times so and that was all in response to changes to legislation and government strategy so it wasn't necessarily something that we were looking to do so my role in that was leading a partnership or establishing a partnership the bus service improvement plan group and then leading them through that challenge um, and actually we produced the bus service improvement plan a very ambitious plan at requesting 113 million pounds from central government the change element there was changing um, mindset was changing people's view on the role of local authorities involved in the bus network and changing the commercial operators view of what a local authority's responsibility was so that, that's been quite challenging recently, but I'm pleased to say that we've made, um, we've made inroads and it's still in development, uh, the partnership itself, but we are heading in the right direction. Um, managing change and performance management um, go hand in hand, I guess, um, and responding when things aren't working well. So as the sponsor and senior responsible officer for a number of multi-million pound um, projects over the years, holding project teams and programme directors to account has been an important part of my role to make sure that projects stay on track and where, um, where they're not to hold them to account and to make the necessary changes. Any uh, supplement, Councillor Hudson? Yeah, two of the top priorities for the Crime Commissioner are for Staffordshire Police, a flexible and responsive service and to support victims and witnesses. How are you going to support the Commissioner in his two priorities? Clearly, I've not started in the role yet, and I'm hopeful 
that after the discussion this morning at the panel that you'll approve my appointment. Um, so I will be working very closely with the Commissioner in the coming weeks and months to address those key challenges. Um, as you all know, I'll have to serve a length of notice at the County Council, but it's my intention to start the work, if approved today, as soon as possible. Thank you. Good morning, Louise. I'm Roger Lees from South South Council. Um, the Commissioner and the Chief Constable are initiating change. We're interested to know how you will ensure there is a culture of delivering results to enable the Commissioner to improve and innovate and effectively deliver his vision. Thank you. Thank you. Um, having a healthy team culture and environment in which people can work is really important. Um, I led a culture change program at Staffordshire County Council about four or five years ago across the whole of the directorate. Um, and the reason for that was we'd conducted a staff survey which established that people were quite dissatisfied, didn't feel listened to, um, didn't feel there was enough support and training in place. And the reason I mention all of that is because through that piece of work, we managed to develop and change the culture. So I was the senior leader that drove that piece of work um, and we established um, staff groups to help shape that. And the importance of that was making sure that everybody was on the same page, that everybody felt able to influence and shape that. So what I'd be looking to do is making sure that the people that I work with and that um, all the partners that I work with, that I can support them to be the very best that they can be by making sure that there's a healthy team environment and healthy culture in which those people can thrive and providing the necessary training um, that's needed um, as necessary for them to be the best that they can be. Um, culture is a difficult thing to change sometimes, but I'm a great believer that you can drive it forward with strong leadership. I think we've proven that um, at the County Council and that my role will be setting the vision and articulating the values that we'll be working to and making sure that it's very clear that this is a path that we're on, that this is a journey that we're on and that everybody needs to be on board. Um, so that will be something I'll be looking to do very early on to understand uh, what those cultural challenges and barriers are and how we can tackle them. All I'd like to say is we look forward to seeing the results. Um, but, uh, Keith Walker, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, morning. Keith Walker, independent member. <clears throat> We've seen over the years that the, the work of the Commissioner's Office is heavily reliant on effective partnerships. And we've seen some very good examples of where partnerships have worked really well. But we've also seen examples of where partnerships haven't worked well. How would you manage the challenge of failing partnerships? Thank you. Um, I think the first thing to recognise is that not every partnership does work and actually the fact that recognising a partnership is failing is a really important part of that journey. Um, and then working with all of those partners to understand what needs to change. So it's about being very transparent, about being very open with the partnership. Um, clearly, I don't understand all of these partnerships just yet, um, having not started in the role. But what I'll be looking to do is establish fairly quickly which partnerships work well, which don't, and look um, further afield um, at what works in other areas, because I'm a great believer in don't reinvent the wheel. If there's best practice that can be used or examples from elsewhere, then we should certainly look at that and consider that. Um, so one of my first... Well, it's going to be a very, very long list, but one of my first actions will be to establish exactly which partnerships require my personal attention sooner rather than later, and then work with those partners um, to improve that situation. Thank you. Any supplement? No. Thank you. And then Councillor Anne, Anne Edgela. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, Louise. County Councillor Anne Edgela, Stafford South East Division. And I won't mention buses <laughs> in my question. <laughs> what is your experience of consult consulting with the public and gaining their views and opinions? Thank you. Um, it's probably one of the most important elements of my role over the, the past 10 years. Um, 
certainly whether it's working, with st we're working on statutory services like home school transport and understanding the needs of the people we serve, so the children, the parents and the schools, and listening to that feedback. But also with the behaviour change project, so working on air aware um, and trying to encourage people to change what they do. You can't do that unless you understand the people that you're working with and you seek their feedback. Um, engagement and um, feedback from the community is, is vitally important there when there was a particularly complex issue that arose last year around the operation of a discretionary transport scheme, the vacant seat scheme. And as part of that, I led an engagement process with the general public to understand the impact that the change in legislation and the potential removal of that scheme would have. And through that feedback, we were able to actually identify some mitigations that wouldn't have been known to us had we not gone through that process. So yeah, absolutely agree that we need to um, engage with the communities, listen to them, and then respond, and not just listen and take that figure and that, that, that narrative, but actually use that to inform how we deliver better services for our, for our residents and communities. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Louise, for your answer. And uh, Councillor Brown-Jones. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning, Louise, and welcome to the panel. Um, you've got a very impressive CV, if I might say, and my question is a fairly open one. Um, within your role, if confirmed today, looking forward to the next few years, what do you see as the main challenges and how do you plan to address them? Thank you. Um, there will be lots of challenges, but that's exactly what I'm looking for in my next step. Um, and I think my biggest challenge will be delivering everything that's laid out in the police and crime plan and the fire plan. Um, so I think that probably covers everything. Um, and then making sure that the commissioner's ambitions are delivered and that the vision is delivered for Staffordshire. On a personal level, I apply for this role because I live in Staffordshire. I want to remain in Staffordshire and I want to continue to make a difference for the people the businesses and the communities that we serve here in Staffordshire. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. The second part of the question was, how, do you, how will you plan for those challenges? You've identified what the biggest challenge is. What will your approach to be, what will your approach be to actually delivering on that? Well, if confirmed today, um, I have already got a plan in process and I'll be sitting down later today with the Commissioner and the Deputy Commissioner to look at what a transition looks like. So identifying of all of those challenges and all of those um, um, matters that require my attention, how we should prioritise those as a team. So that will begin straight away. It will be a couple of months before I take up the position full time. Um, but I assure you, in those early days, I'll be looking to um, identify, as we mentioned earlier, the partnerships that perhaps require the most attention, looking at some of the challenges around staffing and fire, looking at some of the um, issues around culture. So those will be the things that I'll be focusing on in the very early days. Um, but I'm sure I could come back and um, give you a, a, a more detailed plan once in paste, if needed. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Thank you. It's just a quick one. What's your approach to the moorlands, Staffordshire moorlands? Because we have small villages out there. Uh, crime rate is not that bad. But we need to involve these people. You know, it's all right covering the towns. It's all right covering larger villages. But those small little villages out there are vulnerable. Can you sort of give me an approach towards that? please. I think with the changes that the Chief Constable is making to local policing that will be better for all areas of Staffordshire um, which will include the Moorlands. Um, at the moment I'm still understanding um, the aspects that are most important to each of the areas in Staffordshire, so each of the districts and Stoke. Um, and once, once I understand that, I'll be able to then consider that.
that question in more detail. But what I would say is I work very closely with Staffordshire Moorlands at the moment, um, and we've just launched our demand responsive service up there. And I understand how difficult it is for those people living in the most rural areas, the, the remotest parts of Staffordshire that sometimes feel forgotten about and left out. So I really do understand that. Um, and that's why we selected the Moorlands actually as our pilot for our demand responsive service. So I'm hoping that by applying the same logic and working in the same way that I have done with the County Council within the office, that everybody will feel that they're considered um, in full. Thank you, a lovely answer. Beautiful, thanks very much. Well, th th thank you, Louise. I, I, the question, in a sense, took me by surprise. Um, I, I, I understand the sentiment behind it, but I think you've actually answered it very, very well. So uh, I congratulate you on that. Um, what I'd like to do now, members, if there are no further questions uh, regarding it, is to ad adjourn the meeting um, so we are able to sit, sit and, and deliberate um, how we feel that the, the hearing has gone. And, uh, and I wouldn't think any more than five, ten minutes on that basis, but if we could adjourn the meeting, please, and then uh, we, we'll come back. Thank you very much.
Okay, um, I open the, uh, the meeting again, and um, I'm delighted to say that the, uh, the panel has uh, unanimously um, uh, ratified the Commissioner's appointment for Louise to be the Chief Executive. So, welcome, and uh, we, we wish you very well in your, uh, in your uh, new role and uh, look forward to seeing you at future meetings. Okay, so I need to just... The days of a, a, a paper means I've got to, without them, I've got to log in again. And Mandy's come to my rescue. So, um, item five, um, we have uh, decisions published by the uh, Police, Fire and Crime Commissioner. I am, I am under the understanding that the, we don't have any. Is that, did you confirm? That's right, Chair. None have been published on the website since the last meeting. Thank you, Mandy. So moving on then, um, we have um, questions um, from members of the public. Again, Chair, none have been notified um, within the agreed time scales. Thank you. Item seven, um, the police and crime plan update. So I'd welcome um, Ben Adams, please, to uh, presentation of the update. Thank you. Thank you. Um, panel, I want to take a little bit longer just working through this than uh, some of the stuff we've, we've done in the past. Um, I think you'll see that there's a what feels like no time at all we've actually made some considerable progress on some things and I, I think it, some of this just needs to be um, talked through and then put into context with where we're going next because there's still plenty to do so the police and crime plan specifically it's all about reducing crime reducing ASB increasing the confidence of the public um, put simply I want fewer victims and I want those victims to feel supported and I want the, police, uh, the public to feel they've got an excellent uh, police service that's looking after them. I set out in the plan that we needed to be more flexible and responsive. Now, that really uh, could be almost taken anywhere, but the fundamentals in that were improved contact. So if people phone the service, contact the service directly, they get an appropriate and quick response. And then when the service is dispatched, they get to the site, to the incident, rapidly, safely, and ready to investigate. Not frazzled after an hour of blue right running across half the county, but ready to investigate, ready to spend time, ready, hopefully, to stop the next um, incident in that area. The fundamental core work around preventing harm and protecting people runs through the whole service. For me, this is, this is a case of doing that well, doing that as well as others. And I'm just going to pause there for a second, because you may, you may already be planning to ask me some questions about the recent um, publications from Her Majesty's Inspector. We had a child protection inspection in the autumn, which highlighted some good work, but actually highlighted some real disappointments. And a lot of it came back to the time, the capacity to really investigate, to really ask about children's experiences in certain situations, very focused in domestic abuse around the perpetrator and the victim, not necessarily looking at the children that might be in the household asking them about their particular circumstances. And that goes right back to this idea of responsive, good quality response in a timely way from people who might know the families, might know the area, um, and they've got the time to investigate. It's also about contact in the sense of getting the right people talking to the right groups very quickly and quite often social workers 
health professionals, mental health professionals in particular, are certainly part of the team that needs to be interacting with these um, vulnerable people early on. Sometimes they're the people that should be in contact and not the police, but the police will always take the call and respond in the absence of uh, somebody else. So the other thing we had was um, an early indication of how our field inspection is going. And it pointed out that we quite frankly weren't good enough on contact in terms of timeliness and effectiveness or on investigations. So, oh, hands up. No, I'm not the chief constable. Hands up. Neither of those things, in my view, are where anybody in Staffordshire Police want to be. We don't need or want anyone feeling that they're not getting the most excellent service. And this plan fundamentally goes to trying to address some of those issues. Some of what we heard from HMI was a surprise, but frankly, some of it wasn't. If you're not answering the phone within 45 minutes, you've got a problem. What HMI did is very clearly articulate, I think, that that has fundamental impacts on how well you look after people. It's not just about customer service. It's not about convenience. It's about doing the job properly. Now, I can't say I feel entirely responsible for all of that, but I am entirely responsible for improving it and taking it forward in partnership with our new Chief Constable. And one of the reasons he's here is to get us back on track. There's some tremendous work being done by Staffordshire Police. It all needs to be. And he and I are determined that we're going to get there. So the third part, supporting victims and witnesses. Equally mentioned in the reports that victims were not necessarily the focus of the service on those initial contacts. Anybody who saw my last performance, uh, public performance meeting with the chief will know that actually it goes beyond that because we can measure how long it takes for a victim to be picked up by our support service on receipt of the... Um, or how long it takes for the crime data to get to us so we can contact them. And it's taking too long. It should take a day, two days. It shouldn't take two weeks. So we've got a work in progress there as well, which is highlighted in the reports from HMI and more fundamentally is right up there as a priority of my plan because it was pretty obvious to me it wasn't good enough. The reducing reoffending and offending and the more effective criminal justice system I see as core work, core work to preventing crime. It's about intervening early, working with vulnerable people, identifying those at risk of being victims, identifying those at risk of being pulled into crime by the worst kind. And we do some good stuff on this. We'll see in a moment about the commissioning efforts that we've made uh, since I took, um, took over, but also the great um, progress that's been made with stuff in the past. I think we're one of the best commissioning um, police and crime commissioner offices in the country. And the more I travel around and see others, the more comfortable I am with that. We need to focus it, and we particularly need to build on the new opportunity with the national Re reform probation service around um, where we can give people or provide people, push them towards treatment orders, help with their addictions, things that underlie this constant rolling criminality. So dealing with that is not just about the plan, it's not just about the new chief, it's about delivering it. Now he's barely been in three, three and a half months. There's considerable progress already been made. You will already have heard about the operating model. It was mentioned this morning. Uh, Louise mentioned this more um, localised model. The idea is that chief inspectors who know their patch will direct their teams at the local priorities. Seems straightforward, doesn't it? Makes a massive difference if you want to own a problem. 
You haven't got to negotiate, discuss. Today, team, that's the priority. This hasn't gone away for the last two weeks. Make it a priority and have their own resources to do that, whether it's response teams or specialist harm reduction hub where we've got people going in with experience to solve those sticky problems. Now that will be in place by the end of June. It takes a while to get shifts sorted, to move vehicles, to re actually re refit out some, some parts of, uh, of the estate, make sure we've got appropriate sites for tasking in the morning. Um, by the end of June they'll be in place and I expect by autumn to be talking to you about how that operating model is making a difference. We've also had investment from the Chief Constable in the contact centre um, and the switch to more resource into response policing will deal with those two fundamentals around contact and response and investigation. So just moving on, um, that time is key. If you're running around like crazy, chasing down every incident, spending more time in the vehicle, which could be spent talking to the victims, that's all an opportunity to investigate and consider proactive policing lost. So the localization fundamentally matters. On top of that, some of you may remember from my um, election campaign that I felt the service needed the equipment and the resources that it needed. Um, you very kindly approved uh, my budget the other day. It means they will be properly funded. Um, we've used some capital to make sure that the new officers and the new model are all going to get the new remote equipment. So they've got the laptops, better remote access. The pressure for this as a result of the pandemic has been considerable, actually. We need to do the job, whether we're in the office or not, whether we're in a station or not. We need to do the job, and that means you need the kit. So that's going to be brought forward and the right tech will be with those um, frontline teams. And I've made some changes, some of which was um, we've debated here. We had a good neighbourhood panel system, but I didn't feel it was fundamentally representing all of the city and, and county's views. So I wanted a more diverse group of people um, but also build on the experience and passion of those that were, were inclined to stay with us. And I'm pleased to say that the independent scrutiny panels that I set out to set up are now fully recruited and they're starting work. And if you recall, we're looking at stop and search, use of force, things of that nature. Give everybody this sense that whoever, whichever political party your commissioner is related to, um, however pally or unpally, the Commissioner is with the Chiefs, that there's an independent oversight of what we're doing. And I think it's really important, not just in the scrutiny panels, but also with our uh, audit panel, which of course our friend um, Emma here is, is a member of, are always involved in overseeing what we're doing. That independence is important, as it is on the, the panel here. Um, the other thing I've asked them to have a look at is uh, the way we do strip and search. Now this is directly in response to the outcry about that young woman in London who was um, strip searched at school. Um, we do use that technique here. Um, I want to be sure it's in safe environments with appropriate support for the children and all of their uh, rights are protected. But let's not pretend that if somebody of whatever age has chosen to hide drugs inside themselves and those bags of drugs could burst and could cause very serious injury, that there isn't an urgency and a requirement sometimes to do that. And if you're trying to help somebody avoid um, getting deeper into the criminal justice system, you need evidence and you need to investigate appropriately but it must be appropriately. So I'm going to ask the panel to have a look at that in particular. And there's a couple of things I've mentioned specifically to you in the plan around repeat issues of antisocial behaviour, where we can bring our combined resources together, I think, to work better. 
Now, this might be repeats. It keeps happening in the same street. It keeps happening around the same individuals. We can do more together. Probation, housing associations, councils, and the police service to assist in resolving those problems. And you'll see some bits later on. We've brought in a, uh, a new commission service to support victims of ASB, because this stuff really upsets your life if it's not dealt with. And I've spoken to members of the public seven, eight, nine years of the rolling problem. And they need help just to manage it. We've also brought in some mediation support because quite often this is two people who aren't going to get on on their own. They're not going to manage their differences on their own. So that professional support will help. And we've read some terrible stuff uh, in the national press about neighbour disputes turning into the very worst kind of violence. So I'm pleased to have commissioned that during the year. The other thing I mentioned to you is um, making sure that we're all joined up, every district and the city, around illegal trespass. Now, this will help us with um, particularly a lot of waste crime, environmental crime, but also um, managing protests. Now, we are Staffordshire. We are at the centre of the country's network hub, and we will be getting HS2. There will be protests. There will be road blockages. There will be people tying themselves to bits of metal and all the rest of it, like they're doing already in, uh, in various parts of the county. We need to manage that whilst giving people the absolute right to protest and make sure it's safe for them to do so. Because we have issues where I think I'd be protesting as well, some of the stuff around the county, but I would be doing it safely and I wouldn't be gluing myself to the floor. So I set up a force-wide community safety forum to discuss those two particular issues along with taking us more closely um, along the path with health. Now this isn't just fire, potentially with ambulance, potentially with prevention to assist primary health, it's also the police in our conversations on mental health and how we might triage and manage that contact centre better. Because the contact centre is not just about the police doing more, it's about others doing more as well. It needs sorting. We've had a number of fires recently deliberately set. We've had a number of people lose their lives recently due to fires. Very unfortunate given that it was looking um, very low numbers last year but we've had three or four since, all vulnerable, all with some sort of mental health uh, background. So that's paramount to us. And that safety forum gives the community safety partnerships, which some of you are members of, the chance to directly hear from the, um, the two chiefs and to see that we're in good dialogue with these health partners. You'll have read that we've been successful with bidding, particularly around safer streets and also the Safer Women at Night, which means we've brought money in for the city and county. Um, there's a new round called Safer Streets 4, which is a bit wider, has to be match funded, but we've got some quite exciting opportunities, particularly around targeted support for the individuals we think are at uh, most risk of criminality. So we'll come back to you very soon. Like all these things from government at the moment, if you want, if you want the money, you get the bid in damn quick and you have, you've basically got months. And this stuff really occupies our team, actually. It's hard work turning things around so quickly, but we've been very successful. Um, I've confirmed that I'm going to fund the space programme for another three years. This is the holiday, program, uh, holiday activities programme, diversionary programme. So that's over £200,000 for the next each of the next three years. I've also confirmed I'm supporting community safety partnerships in their localities. That's three quarters of a million pounds a year for three years that they can be sure is coming, make local commissioning decisions on. And I've got a couple of grant um, programs that have kicked off this month. 
One is 100,000 pounds, that's 10 grand for each area around ASB. Another is 100 grand to support community, um, community groups, individuals, small charities that are doing something around community safety in an area and not only to support what they're doing, but to support them in becoming stronger. So hopefully they're going to roll and do the same for a few more years to come. It's not just a spend and run, it's a, an invest in that local capacity. You'll see in the report, sexual assault, sexual abuse service, that's very new. Uh, Staffordshire Women's Aid have been providing that. 650 people in the first year. I went to see that, um, the team there, they're doing some fantastic work. Um, some people in, in real distress, some people actually several years down the line coming for help there in, in order to, to build their capacity to move on. We've also commissioned a hate crime service. Um, I'm pleased that this is not the issue it is in some areas, but it matters, it, it upsets lives. And if we can deal with this, particularly with some of the mediation, it actually keeps it from becoming a quite time-consuming uh, demand on the police. A new era are continuing to provide, getting on for 20,000 plus um, domestic abuse uh, referrals, managing those 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That was particularly important, as you know, during the um, pandemic. I do want to mention a couple of other things government are doing. The main one is the drug uh, strategy that's uh, recently been announced. This is extra funding primarily for treatment. Um, treatment in prisons, treatment on release, and also treatment um, on top of the health provided treatment for addiction. I think this is this is probably more important than anything else in terms of making a difference to long-term reoffending. Um, there's that terrible story, wasn't there, at the weekend about the young the young boy in Birmingham, six-year-old, Hakan, I think his name was, and he wasn't getting his um, his asthma treatment because his mom was using the the kit for her drug habit. I mean, it just couldn't be more awful. Anything we can do to support people off drugs, to support people if they're still on it, so that they're not engaged in criminality, not feeding drug criminals, the better. So I am taking a particular interest in this piece of work through the Community Safety Forum, uh, along with the leads at the county and city and a lot of that comes back down to this criminal justice now I remember being challenged specifically at an earlier meeting how am I going to make a difference with this criminal justice stuff for me it is not just about getting into the business of how long it takes us to take a case to the criminal prosecution service and then how long does it take them to take it to court although I am doing that and government has provided us with some new benchmark dashboards to help hold people to account across the system. It's also about keeping people out of the system when it's appropriate. And if that means particularly young people presenting with something where a drug or alcohol treatment order might mean they get assistance sooner, not waiting for a court case, sooner, on the basis if they bounce, they're into court. On the basis it's right for that individual. Then let's just invest that little bit of different thinking in keeping them from becoming uh, a problem to the services for many years to come. So those treatment orders which we're piloting are going very well. NHS England are going to fund those into the future. We've had a commitment on that basis. Uh, so that's a super piece of work that the team have been doing. I've rattled on a bit there, Chair, apologies, but I want to fundamentally make clear, we're doing some stuff really well, 
My office is doing some very good stuff. The service is doing some exceptional stuff. Every person I meet is absolutely committed to doing the right thing. Some of it's not where it needs to be right now. I think when we get our um, Peel report published in a few months' time, it might not do as well as the previous one. But I can tell you, it will not be a reflection on what's happening today. And it won't be a reflection of where we're going. So I'm going to keep bringing back to you the information that tells you the direction we're headed in and what we're determined to improve. There'll be more of this in an annual report in June, which will be more about plan delivery and particularly about the operations of my own office, because some people uh, question the value of it. Always will, actually, but I'm very comfortable. We make a big difference, and it's value for money. Um, but happy to take any questions on that. Oh, Chairman, I've dropped a clangor there. Can I cheat? Are you likely to ask a question about road safety in our subsequent session? If not, could I just ask Helen to give us a quick update on where we are with road safety? Because I'm afraid, folks, this is difficult hearing at the minute. With your permission, Chair. Yep, but more than that. Thank you. Morning, everybody. Um, yeah, it's um, it, it's not it's not good news um, uh, at all. We've had um, so far this year um, we've had 12 people lose their lives on our on our roads, um, and in fact we've had two just over this weekend. Um, in this is um, you know th this is this is devastating for families, um, changing lives forever for those families and um, people living with life-changing injuries. Um, just, to, um, just to sort of uh, compare that to the numbers uh, from last year, um, we had 18 over the whole year, 18 fatal collisions, um, and 15 of those were involved in uh, at least one of our priority road user groups, um, like motorcyclists, pedal cyclists, mature drivers, young drivers. Um, so this, this year, um, we've had three mature drivers so far that I've got the, the information for, uh, one mature passenger, uh, four pedestrians, two motorcycle, uh, riders and uh, and one young driver so um, as you can see um, it's not it's not great um, I don't know where the figures are going to end up for the end of the year but I would like to take the opportunity uh, to reassure members that the work of the Staffordshire so Safer Roads Partnership focuses on these seven priority road users uh, areas with lots of targeted activity. Um, the Commissioner and I now co-chair the, uh, the Staffordshire Safer Roads Partnership. I'm very keen that the work we do um, stays ahead of the trends um, and we're currently seeing more mature drivers um, being killed or seriously injured on our roads. We need to do what we can um, to understand why this is happening and um, more importantly what we can do uh, as a partnership to, uh, to cut these numbers. So I just wanted to, to give a, a little bit of, a, of an update. It's, uh, it's, not, it's not good news but I think um, everybody knows that we have a, a a real priority on road safety and this is uh, this has not been a great start of the year thank you thank you commissioner thank you thank you C can I, uh, ben adams and then i'll uh, bring phil in. yeah chairman just to, just to fill in there he, he, what, what i think is important is to note that some of these accidents aren't avoidable if people have a heart attack or a, a stroke some sort of health related issue um, they may end up on the wrong side of the road and and this stuff does happen um, however some of it is uh, mitigatable. It's not just speed, uh, it's drug driving, it's drink driving, it's people using mobile phones. You'll have seen, anybody who follows our social media will see the roads policing unit were out in the HGV the other day where they get a sort of bird's eye view. They've got transit drivers, lorry drivers on iPads whilst they're driving their vehicles. And honestly, some of it is just, you, you think, what on earth is going on? So we're going to keep the pressure up on this. Um, some people don't like seeing the camera van. I think it's our job. And we've got actually somebody coming into comms in the 
Safe Roads partnership because of this. I think it is very important they realise they're also looking for uninsured vehicles, they're looking for people not wearing safety belts, they're looking for people who are willfully putting their lives and others at risk. It's not just about speeding, but slow down as well. Thank, thank you, Ben. And Phil Hudson? Yeah, Helen. Um, I, I mean, I, I ride the blood bikes, and I've got, I, I ride a marked bike. And can I say that uh, I think COVID has got a lot to do with people driving, that people seem to have forgotten how to drive now. And even with a marked bike, I get people pulling out on me and all sorts of things. Um, so, you know, I think it's going to take some time for people to get back and get road sense again, because I think that's been, with people not ride, driving for 12 months, some of them, you know, and it's, it's getting it back into it. I know that the road policing team were taken off their duties for a while and had to backfill for the IMU. Do you think that that might have had a bit of an issue and the, not having so many road policing officers out there dealing with the things that they are now doing? But I know that, uh, you know, that they were taken off road policing duties for a bit because um, I, I needed their help and I couldn't get it because of things like that. But uh, you have my full support at Utoxity, you know, with Speedwatch. We do hope to actually get to see you because we've, <laughs> we've tried twice now. And um, are there going to be any grants this year to help? Because as a county councillor and the town council, we've spent thousands of pounds on SIDS. Uh, we're getting our last two are going up in Utoxity. And I've been asked by Richard Raisin, do I have any grass verges in Utoxity that don't have a SID sign? But they do work and... Um, you know, we could do with perhaps a bit of funding from the Safer Roads Partnership to help us uh, with some of the things. I, I've paid for the speed watch signs to go up from the county council out of my local divisional budget, you know, but uh, it would be nice. We've, we've spent thousands. It would be nice to, if any future projects that we could perhaps get some grants for, please. Um, we've got a, I've got my next public performance meeting coming up with the chief on the 24th of May. Um, we'll, we're going to be asking specific question around Roads policing. Um, I appreciate they needed the um, resource actually for, for response, uh, and the demand has been considerable. And it didn't mean they weren't doing road policing. And of course, we've also got our um, motorways group, which continues round the clock in partnership with the West Midlands. So the activities continued. Um, you know, Helen and I's view is that it, it's always a good thing, and we, the more we can do of that, the better. And I think the new model will allow for more capacity from um, neighbourhood and response cops around uh, traffic-related issues as well. Uh, we haven't at the moment got any budget in for SSRP for grants. Uh, we've done that in the past. I've had a look at them, and they've been a little bit, um, let's just say, of, of, of mixed value, I think. I think in some cases it's worked well. I greatly appreciate that you're funding that through your own uh, resource, through your own council resources, which is excellent. Um, have a look at that community grant that I'm talking about, because some organisations it will fit very closely with that, and um, it, it may be that the uh, that that will fill one or, two, one or two gaps. I've got councillor Tony Holmes. Commissioner, it's a strange question, but can you bring any pressure to bear on the portfolio holder within the county council for replacing signs that have actually been demolished by accidents? Because we have a number through the village that have been taken out of the ground and just left bent over. You know where I live, just at the end of the A50, where everybody likes to tip a lorry over on the side of the roundabout. Uh, but we've got signs missing all over the place, 30 mile an hour signs, reduced speed, everything has been sort of... We've had a, a session of bad accidents, and we asked the portfolio to replace these signs, and there's probably been down 12 months now. There's no... Can you bring any pressure to bear on him? David Williams is the portfolio holder. Thank you. Um, well... Speak to County Councillor first, yeah, of course. Yeah, the Chairman, I, 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 and I, I, good, well, Commissioner, I feel keep lobbying. free to answer, but I actually think that that question is directed to your County Councillor. Yeah. Uh, I certainly know from my experience there was an absence of two plus years of, of road signs and we've now got them replaced, mm -hmm. only because I've pursued it. And I think that's probably where the question lies, uh, Tony. Um, Can I, may, I, a, uh, may I comment on that, please? 
We have spoken to the portfolio holder. We have bought the portfolio holder to task by his whip. We have bought the portfolio holder by the head of the council, and he has not responded once. Well, you, you, you need to take that up, and I'm going to move that on, because that isn't a, a question for the co commissioner or our brief. Um, so um, I've got now um, Brian Jones. Thank you, Chairman. Um, a question for Helen, please, if I may. I was really interested in the work that's going on with the various groups, the elderly, the young, etc. Uh, and I wonder, do we currently do anything for people, say, who are convicted of drink driving or driving under the influence of drugs? They may not yet have killed anybody, but there's clearly a potential for them to do so in the future. You've got real evidence of people who are drink driving. And I wonder if some kind of education programme after they've been convicted. Similarly with young people, perhaps if they've just passed the test, I'm not sure that we'd be necessarily aware of that information, whether we could do some kind of a programme or information sharing with them as to driving safely, because that's two specific target groups that there's an education issue, I'd suggest. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, the... Um the, the young drivers, um, so 17 to, to 24, um, there's a lot of work being done um, through schools and colleges and, and the Prince's Trust. Um, there's, um, the SSRP also has a, 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 a new driver's website. Um, I think it's called Helping, Helping New Drivers. So there's lots, lots of information um, there available. Um, I'm not, I, I can't say that I'm sure about the help that would you convicted drink drivers get afterwards? I don't know if the commissioner knows that, um, but I'm I'm not aware of it. But yeah, I mean anything to encourage people to not do not you know this behaviour in the first place, or definitely not to do it again. Um, yeah, I'll make a note of that though. Thank you. Okay, do you wish to come back on it, Brian? Brian? No, that's fine. No, that, that's fine. Um, Adrian Bowen. Thank you, Chair. Adrian Bowen, independent member. Um, Commissioner, you commented earlier on the two recent HMIC reports, which I think we'd all agree made very disappointing and disturbing reading. Um, I guess at some stage they will come back for a follow-up, maybe 12 months later. I don't know if we know that yet. Um, but two questions for you, please. As Commissioner, um, to what extent are you holding the Chief Constable to account for this? I appreciate that person is in a new position. But nevertheless, it's that person's responsibility to sort this out. Um, and secondly, what measures are you taking to chart progress on this uh, as a result of any actions that he might be taking? Thank you. Um, I, I see those two as part of the same thing, really. You've got to, I've got to effectively hold the service to account through him. Um, uh, the two letters of concern have actually got date requirements on them can't quite recall if it's 60 and 90 days but it's something of that nature so we're going to need to see progress within two or three months um, now that really means I need to be seeing progress within uh, days and weeks I certainly need to see plans and and so on I'm reasonably confident about these two areas of of work because they were already identified by the service um, some months ago actually just before the um, the new chief took took his position so I'm confident that we've got a plan of action. The operating model is definitely part of that, as is the change in the way that we're doing contact. Um, but I never start, I, I must, well, I won't make apologies actually for being a, a, a pain, be, because I, I constantly keep, keep on about this stuff. For, for me, performance isn't how well are we doing, full stop. It's how well are we doing to the plan, now, what is the target? What were we hoping to achieve? Have we achieved it or not? Because it may well be with the best will in the world that the plan isn't the right one, or, or, or on trying to implement it, it doesn't deliver. And you need to be able to call that early to say, are we really where we need to be? So considerable amount of attention being given to these particular areas of work. There is a requirement to demonstrate to HMI that there's progress. And I'm really comfortable that that fits in 
with the plan I'd put to him, but also he's developing a um, policing plan for Staffordshire as well. Because we're all singing from the same hymn sheet on this. In a way, the inspectors have endorsed the concerns that the service was aware um, they needed to deal with anyway. So, yeah, it, it's a full-time job. Now, again, you'll hear this publicly. We'll debate it. Um, the Chief and I on the 24th of May in terms of some of the detail and um, we can't share everything but we'll share progress uh, where it's been made. A quick follow up then please. So uh, I guess we've all had experience that when you focus on a problem area sometimes that's at the expense of another area because resources and time get shifted. Do you think we can attack these issues from the reports without diverting um, uh, resources and that from other areas? Thank you. D that's a really good question, and you, you've no doubt been there before, because every organisation can lurch from one uh, today's priority to tomorrow's priority, and that's not healthy. Um, I'm very comfortable with the way that the service under the new chief have set up a new governance structure around their own performance. Um, they have priorities dealt with at one performance board. They then have sort of um, rolling issues, emerging issues dealt at, at another. And we're working together around the enabling services, you know, the core delivery. It, it's really important because there are things that are not necessarily as good as they might be, but will never make their way to the top of an operational priority list. So on that sense, you have to keep doing the business in, in your departmental areas. You know, it is recruitment, for example, or the well-being of the staff. That needs to continue to be at, at a high level. And that means it needs performance man managing every single day. You can't not do that because you're all suddenly embarked on what was um, nationally uh, raised. So I absolutely get that point. And um, it's not easy, you know. Most, a lot of organisations get that wrong. So I, I think we're getting there. I'll come back and talk some more about that, um, particularly around, um, I think around some of the stuff we're seeing around the country around culture and confidence. You know, that is a rolling program of trying to change the way an organization operates. And you need to do that without losing sight of today's priority. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you for your reports, uh, Commissioner. I've got one or two questions, actually. My first question is about child protection and about children going missing. Have you any idea of how many children are going missing from a home environment and how many children are going missing from a care environment? You know, uh, because that is quite concerning. So that's my first question. My second question is about um, on page 17, you talk about antisocial behaviour delivery group. Uh, will this create more work for the police, uh, offi uh, police crime commissioner office? And will it, be, will, it, will, it be, will it will it mean increasing your budget? That's uh, my second question. My third question. Um, shall I shall I stop there, Chairman? And thank you. I'll come back. <laughs> we'll let you come back for your third, but. Uh... Ben Adams. Um, thank you, Anne. Yeah, on, on, uh, in the paper on page 18 there, you can see some of the individual numbers. So 2,776 missing incidents, 1,500 individual children in 12 months. So that service we commissioned, I visited Catch-22. They're based up in uh, Stoke by the university. They do a tremendous job. Um, this is one of those moments in time when you might be able to make a significant difference in, in the young person's life. They've gone missing for a reason. Um, the return to home interview is vital. And why have you gone missing? What, what, what is the issue? There'll be generally an issue at school, at, at home, whatever. Um, and in some cases, support and mentoring, particularly of some of those individuals, makes a massive difference. Um, when people go missing, it really does take a huge amount of resources from the police service. It, everybody, 
piles onto it and, and they're not doing other stuff whilst they're doing that. It, it, it really is a big impact. So it's, um, it's a key thing. It's something I'm, I'm very keen we continue to support. Now, I don't know the split there as, as to how many are um, in a care setting of some sort. Um, it, it'll be a significant number. So if you don't mind, I'll report back to you on that particular item. Now, this antisocial behaviour uh, focus, I'm very keen. The local CSPs don't need the Commissioner's Office telling them how to do local antisocial behaviour. What I'm looking for is what can we do um, strategically or around the piece that would add value. So whether it's in uh, Litchfield, Moorlands, Tamworth, Stoke, wherever, um, what can we add value? And for me, the key thing is repeat incidents. Now, I can talk to partners in a way that the individual local CSP might not be able to. So if we need children's mental health services differently involved, if we need a county housing association involved on a different level, I can possibly assist with that. So it's about looking at the issues behind repeat incidents, looking where maybe the way the service supports the local partners can, can change. And maybe in some cases it's about consistency. We've got what's called a community trigger. The, this is legislation that came out about five, six years ago. This should allow any individual to say, I've had enough here. We've had three or four goes at this and it's not resolved. I'm going to instigate a community trigger. How you do that is different in every district and the city. That doesn't help the service to respond. So I want, for a start, if nothing else from this uh, working group, I want to arrive at a single way of doing community triggers. We're going to let the public know about them a bit more and we're going to demonstrate that it makes a difference. But on, this isn't about doing the everyday job. Yes, there will be a bit of t work in that for us, but not significantly. And in fact, part of um, Louise's job is going to be managing where some of the stuff we used to do, which we're less busy on, now becomes new areas of work and focus where we're going to be very busy. And some of this stuff, and particularly the community, uh, sorry, the criminal justice side, um, we need to lift that and we need a, perhaps a different set of skills or people doing things slightly differently. I'm hoping to keep it within a very similar budget. I saved some money last year. I have a bit of capacity and we'll see what we can do. If I spend any more money, it'll be to reduce crime. Thank you. And your third question? Yeah. Thank you for that, Commissioner. Yeah. Uh, on page 21 of your report, you talk about prison release. I'd, I know, right, as a mum that's been in a, a room where granis is, uh, uh, cannabis has been grown and, 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 you know, and having to get the police involved and that, and you know my situation, so I won't go into that. But my concern is about prison release. And before these people get into prison, Commissioner, what work are we doing in schools to stop these young children getting onto drugs? Because this, this is where it starts, right at an early age, where they're getting onto, into school, you know, um, starting on drugs when they're at that school age, and then it builds up and builds up while, you know, they're, 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 they're reliant on it. So what work are we doing in schools? And then, all right, that's my first part of the question, but the second part of it, on prison release, um, and you've talked a lot about mental illness and about mental health. Are you doing any work with the Midland Partnership Foundation Trust regarding prison release? And, um, and what help are you giving these people that's coming out of prison that's got mental health problems? And how are we working with that, you know, to, to stop them actually probably going back into um, re-offending um, and, and, and going back into prison? Because, again, the concern is these people with mental illness coming out of prison, um, they are on probably benefits or what have you, and you know as well as I do, probably, Commissioner, that these trolls, if you like, in the drug situation are using these people to do their, shall we say, dirty work, for want of a better phrase. So how can we stop that escalation? It's... Um 
the reducing reoffending piece of the work is really fundamentally about um, doing what we can to support people that maybe they've ended up in prison, maybe they haven't. Um, and refreshing all of that, but with a, a, a view to building on what's been successful for us. We've been very successful around juvenile offending, not so much about um, uh, the older cohort. Um, I'm just about to do a piece of commissioning around enhanced employment. So this is for people that, when they come out of prison, they, the two things they most need are um, housing, support with getting themselves set up in terms of rent support, um, etc. The next thing they, they really need is a job. And we've got a number of offenders who, who, for one reason or another, never make that step to the job. It then makes it too easy to step back into to criminality. So we're going to have a, a pilot project, a bit like the one that was uh, successful with the treatment requirements, around finding work and um, supporting people back into employment. The police service have got a significant offender management team they work as, uh, as officers, as probation, um, and others. In some cases, they're obliged to watch some people that have been released. They'll have been released early. They're on, they're on parole, on probation. Um, in other cases, it's staying in touch and watching those that are most at risk. And I, I had a visit um, three or four weeks ago. It was one of the best things I've done as commissioner, actually. I met with one of our police officers who operates up in... Um, Stoke-on-Trent, out of Longton. Uh, we met a ex-offender who'd managed to kick a heroin habit after 40-odd years. Um, we met some people who were struggling. Uh, I met a couple of housing providers. Um, some excellent provision, some not so good. And it was real eye-opener just to see um, just how important it is that at that moment, those few weeks when somebody leaves prison, doing everything you can so that the attraction of going and buying some more gear from the guy over the road is less attractive. Quite often people are determined to have a go, but it can very quickly be compromised if they're, uh, if they're struggling. So that, the treatment requirements I talked about, and there's another element in this report I didn't mention. We've, we've employed two PHSE coordinators. Now, in the schools, PHSE is public health. I think it looks at, um, at sexual health and other things as well. These are the classes that government now require every ch child to have. With the best will in the world, there's some brilliant teachers at this. Some teachers are not comfortable with this, or it's new to them, or they need help. And the PHSE coordinators are there to help develop um, content, put together um, programs of work. And uh, I was at Burton talking at a knife crime um, meeting that the MP pulled together on Friday. Half a dozen schools there said, thank you very much for the PHSE coordinator, because she's assisting us in delivering this piece of work specifically around um, the risk of county lines and drug-related crime. So it's, um, it's fundamentally going to the heart of what you're saying. I think the real key for me is if somebody is using, somebody is clearly involved with some drug criminals, that the police, the PCSOs and others have a, a good set of options to get them to some treatment early. It's not just about a fine. It's, cer it's certainly rarely about banging someone up in that situation. It's within days, you're going to go and have this counselling for six weeks. You're going to have this treatment for the next six weeks. You're going to turn up and you're going to do it. And that sort of option is, for me, fundamental to just keeping those people out from making the biggest mistake of their lives. Thank you. Commissioner. Now I've got uh, Keith Walker next and then uh, uh, Ma Martin um, Summers and Brian Jones So, and, uh, and Phil Hudson's just indicated. So obviously if we could uh, try and be mindful of time and so forth, don't want to rush it because it's important, but 
But, uh, Keith. Thank you, Chair. For some years, the force has had a, a multi-agency safeguarding hub at Stone, which used to be the envy of many forces. Um, it's filled with experts from different organisations whose job I thought it was to identify and mitigate a lot of the issues raised in these inspection reports. Now, with that sort of facility and those so-called experts working together to provide solutions to these problems, the processes and systems are obviously broken somewhere. And where, where have the processes broken to lead to a situation where this so-called pool of experts is not able to, to fulfill what they're expected to, to fulfill? Keith, I think, I think you've identified something um, important there. It, it is in the report, Child Protection Report. Um, what, one of the things we've seen with the pandemic is a sort of opportunity to compare um, effectiveness when organisations are co-located and physically sat across the room from each other and when they're not. And there's more work needs to be done on this to see exactly what is going on. But it appears the co-location has, um, has added less value than people originally thought. That the organisations were still um, more focused on their own part of the solution rather than keeping that victim focus at the core of it. Um, I'm looking at this in some detail at the moment because... Uh, I don't quite know where it's going to take us with the MASH, the multi-agency safeguarding hub, but certainly putting, all, putting people in one room is not the full answer. You need the culture change. We've got a big problem still with data sharing across organisations and services. Um, and I think we need to be more focused on where the blockers are um, and, and that physical interaction. The physical interaction worked very well in some cases, but if somebody's out three days a week, it, it isn't the answer. And you can pick up the phone, you can make a, a video call, you can be in touch just as effectively, um, potentially from your own base. So we're looking again at that, but it was in a way, I think, a good steer from the report that is this really working as effectively as it should do? And you're quite right to mention that looking after children is not just about uh, the police service. It, it's that wider group. Um, and in a way, we've, we've all got to reflect on what that means for us. And I know we are in terms of coming together to provide the, the solution. I'd welcome an opportunity to come back to you again on that, perhaps in, uh, in a few months' time, because there is a question about whether that mashes the model to take forward. Okay, thank you. Um, I, my apologies go to uh, Anna Edgley. I didn't allow her to want to come back. Do you still wish to come back? Sorry, Chairman, I'll come back with some different questions. Thank, okay. Um, so I'd like to uh, welcome um, Martin Summers from Tam Tamworth as his first meeting. So uh, welcome to the meeting, Martin, and uh, your uh, question to uh, the Commissioner. Thank you. Sorry, I'm sitting behind you. I'll try to go over there next time. Um, just, just a thought, Commissioner. Does, uh, you mention um, treatment, uh, drug treatments in your report, but uh, do you have any plans in progress uh, for the rollout of the naloxo nasal spray, uh, which is a potentially life-saving treatment that can be del delivered by officers at the scene of a drug overdose? And it's believed to help uh, in those, those people who've suffered overdoses engage with treatment going forwards. Um, Martin, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if we already use that in some cases or, or exactly how and why. I know it's a lifesaver, in, 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 particularly if uh, somebody's overdosed. It can, um, it can be a lifesaver. I'd have to report back to you on that as to exactly where, what the current use is and what the, um, if there's any planned expansion of it. Thank you. Back on that. 
Um, no, I have another question, but I'm happy to wait. Um, so, um, Brian Jones. Thank you, Chairman. A uh, question, um, please, Commissioner, on your independent scrutiny panels. Um, it's great that you recognise there was a problem with the safer neighbourhood panels, and I absolutely um, agree with you that we have to have a more diverse representation on those panels, and it's, it's key that the, the public can scrutinise the work of the police. I also like the ad hoc approach and welcome your comments around strip search and other bespoke things that, that may come to the fore. Having been um, a former police officer, when I retired, I joined a safer neighbourhood panel and before I was in politics. And I'm disappointed to say I, la I left after a year because it was totally ineffective. There was no training whatsoever. And, and frankly, um, not all, there were some good people there, but there, there were a, a few members of that panel who, who actually were on there for all the wrong reasons, and I, I won't go into that. So in terms of the new setup, you said you've recruited all the new members. Uh, has, that, has there been a process to that? Are you looking at the reasons and the motivations? Is the training for them? And I know this is a triple question, sorry. And how will you monitor the success of them going forward? Um, yes, there's a quite, been quite a heavy process, actually, on, on recruitment. I'm pleased that some of the previous panel members who um, had an appetite for scrutiny have, have, have applied and, and been successful. Uh, not all were. Um, and that, I guess a test of the robustness is that not everybody who wanted to be on a panel has got on one. Um, I think the fact that we've got a single uh, sort of centralised resource means that the training will be um, perhaps more uh, focused, but it, it is considerable. And the police service have, have expressed an interest in using some of those individuals to help them with their independent advice and guidance as well, which I'm really pleased about because I don't think it's good use of public money to be out recruiting twice for essentially the same uh, public-minded, uh, experienced people. So yeah, I'm very comfortable. We've got a nice, um, a nice mix, more reflective of the county, different opinions, different ages, and. Um, I think the proof will be in the pudding, actually, when we see the first set of reports from them. The scrutiny before worked very well. Uh, in terms of stop and search, in particular, it gave us some very useful data. So I'm expecting more of the same, really. And then one of the panels is almost a floater, where we will ask them to look at issues uh, that emerge. And I think that will be helpful. There might have been an opportunity around, um, I don't know, violence against women and girls last year culture in the police service where we could have said would you go and have a look at this through a Staffordshire lens so looking forward to more from them uh, thank you and um, Phil Hudson yeah Commissioner I've got three points please <coughs> um, can I first say thank you so much for listening to me when we spoke all many many months ago about um, Keep it local, keep it simple, and it works. And you now introducing these new hubs for police officers to be stationed at to get to incidents quicker, I think is fantastic. Um, but obviously there's a cost to that, so how much is it? So we've gone in a big circle now in Staffordshire Police from having lots of areas to not having many, and now we're going to have a few more. What, what is the cost and the impact on that on our budget? Um, most of the issues that I tend to be made aware of is at the point of delivery. It's when the officers turn up. And most of the issues are is that uh, there seems to be so often a negative attitude. People don't know how to deal with the incidents that they're being sent to deal with. So how much influence have you got on in a way in which um, is it the fact that the re inspecting ranks have been reduced over the years? Uh, are there not enough supervision out there supervising the incidents that are going on? Or is it national training do we need to look at the way in which we're training our police officers because it's all very well saying we want our police officers to have degrees and all this and the other but if they can't deal with the fundamental day-to-day -day policing of simple incidents or perhaps they can but it's the perception that's coming across to members of the public uh, and my third one is 
in your role on the criminal justice system, um, we've gone around in a big circle in which we um, have our patrols situated in Staffordshire. I think in the country as a whole, the criminal justice system needs really looking at again because we've closed all the centres for criminal justice and now you have to go miles and miles to go to court. And I think that that's got a fundamental... Um, uh, how things in the country you know are, are not doing well um, perhaps we there's a whole of the country needs to look at in the way in which we have our criminal justice system and instead of just having two or three centers within Staffordshire I mean, we used to have one in nearly every town and local justice was dealt with quickly simply we've now got months and months where people have to wait to go to court you've got reluctant witnesses wanting to travel lots of miles to go and give evidence you know, and I think the whole system really needs looking at fundamentally. Thank you. Um, well, Phil, f firstly, in terms of local, um, I, ha I have my own views. What I was most concerned about is that people got the experience they were asking for, and it's the chief constable who's come up with the design of the, the plan um, and the new model. Uh, you're right, it, it is traditional in the sense that... Um, uh, more locally based. I think the important thing is the local ownership, though. It's that responsibility and leadership locally and the local knowledge. Um, it should not be costing us much more. Uh, there are costs because we re we're fitting out some, uh, some places differently. We've got to find more space for vehicles in different locations. And in some cases, you'll be in uh, a couple of spots in an area where you might pre previously been served by one. Um, there were cost implications of the old model, J just running vehicles. For, for more distance, vehicles that weren't designed for those sorts of distances. And it was part of the issue when they arrived at a, an incident. Uh, I mentioned before, you arrive after an hour of blue light driving at speed uh, and try and be um, as uh, supportive and patient as you might. It's, it's tricky. So, so that model's important. Um, also, the way we were set up, um, quite often neighbourhood police were being... Uh, tasked with response jobs, urgent response jobs. They weren't necessarily the best people for that, and it meant that they weren't doing the neighbourhood work they'd set out to do that morning. So perhaps working with a particular individual or, or particular community. So I think we're going to have more people in the, in the right spaces to suit their skills, and part of what we're doing in this three months is asking people where would they like to uh, focus. I'm not picking up very much in, at all about individuals having a poor experience of office, officers face-to-face. -face. Uh, quite the contrary, actually. Um, particularly not with the younger recruits. Um, I am aware that the uh, chief is quite keen to understand that user experience as best he can, because it's not just about complaints. This is just a, uh, you know, did you get what you expected there? Was that as professional as you were expecting? Generally, the answer is yes. Um, where we've had issues is around the timeliness and then the outcome. So I think all three matter, but I'm not overly concerned about culture. Just, just to dispel a myth, um, if, you qual if you train as a police officer now, you get a degree equivalent at the end of that process. That recognises that the training was of a degree standard. You need those skills, quite frankly, if you're safeguarding, working with IT, working with people of all ages, fraud. It, it requires a certain capability. There are degree entry programmes, but not everybody coming in has got a degree. And we've got people coming in of all ages, from all backgrounds, all experiences, uh, which I think is vital, exactly as you say. It's more about your how you deal with people that makes you a good police officer. Um, finally, on the, um, the legal system, I think there are some issues with the legal system. I don't think it's answered by spending more money on more buildings. I think it's, it will be fundamentally answered in the way some of it is being um, attacked now, at looking at entrenched ways of working. Uh, we've had a year, I think, where... Um, the number of hours of sitting in courts has massively increased. It's just got to become the norm. It, why we weren't sitting all those hours before, I just don't know. Um, Helen and I look very carefully at um, dropout, 
so when victims don't proceed with a court case, and time is a big issue, whether witnesses are properly um, advised, planned, given a chance to go to the court first, make sure they don't drop out at the last minute. Uh, I think in, uh, in the Birmingham area, about a quarter of cases were cracking on the day uh, last year. So a quarter of cases fail because somebody hasn't turned up or something hasn't happened on the day. It's just totally unacceptable. That's lost, lost time. So there's an awful lot we can go at. Um, it, 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 isn't about, it isn't about whether you can walk or get a local bus to the court. Thankfully, people are going to these um, cases, you know, hopefully once a lifetime, if that. Uh, it, it's not something that, that is around um, convenience. It's about being properly supported through the process. Um, but I will keep coming back on that because there are some opportunities. Thank you, com Commissioner. Um, and did you want to come back with another yeah, question? Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I've, yeah, I've got about three actually. Sorry, Chairman, but um, yeah. I, well, first of all, congratulations on the space program, Commissioner. I'm really pleased that you're putting money into that because that started in the early 90s, and I'm really see that it's 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 ongoing. Um, the community um, uh, on page 17, four point. 2.2 uh, the 5,000 pound community groups when will that be available that money yeah. it's not available now thank you very much for that and also community safety partnerships where are they based how are these people chosen and will it be a public meeting when they hold their meetings will it be public well, um, community safety partnerships have been in uh, as a statutory duty for local councils um, back to the 90s, I think. Yeah, it, 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 it's a council, probation, housing association and police partnership. Every local council's got one. Um, generally, there'll be a lead member and then there's a, a coming together at county level in the form of the RAG, the Responsible Authorities Group, mm. which you can definitely sit in on. Um, and in the city, they have two uh, community safety partnerships and uh, their leader the leader of the council actually chairs uh, that function there she takes it so seriously so for me it's fundamentally about how you locally hold those services and influence them and also do your bit as a council thank you uh, councillor jones and then i would dr draw this item to yeah commissioner i think anne's question mm -hmm. may have been about the new Staffs and Stoke on Trent Community Safety Strategic Board. That, that, that's it has the a one I'm talking name. about. I think that's Sorry, what yeah, I, I mean, I know all what you've just said, but what, this is the new. Uh, uh, sorry. Apologies, apologies, Anne. Yeah, the new forum. I'm going to meet Thank probably you, three <laughs> times a year. Um, there are about 30 people involved last time, and a good number of those were remote. Um, I'm sending invites to all the community safety partners. So if you want to get uh, a, a question in there or to hear feedback from it, um, I'd suggest talking to your portfolio holder at Stafford. Right, okay, thank you for that. Can I just come back with a quick question to the fire people? Because they've been ignored this morning and they've not had a question, so can I just put another question? To uh, the... well... <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll leave it till next time. Thank you. Uh, not to come back on anything, Chair, just um, a point, please, on the Police and Crime Plan update, which contains some very very useful, very interesting information. Uh, but when can we expect to see a report on the results, and how do you intend to, to report the results of your Police and Crime Plan? Um, in terms of performance, the public performance meeting is the key thing. Um, so that's the one with the Chief Constable I mentioned in May. You'll see statistics at that, at that, um, uh, at that public meeting. Uh, they, they will be available. Actually, the, the, the data I'm asking for at that meeting will now carry through um, and be a f substantial part of the service's own performance monitoring as well. So we're, I'm very keen that we're all looking at a subset of the same data and that people have the opportunity to build familiarity with it. Also, in my annual report in June, you'll see um, probably a higher level result of where we've got to already, 
but more detail around some of the commissioning that we do and the way my office actually um, delivers its side of the equation as well. So some key highlights will be in there at two, but the key thing is the public performance meeting. Now, Chair, I'm very happy, uh, and it might assist, is if you were to receive those, uh, that data pack in advance of that meeting. So at least three times a year, you're seeing the same data that I'm holding to the, the Chief to account on. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for that. <coughs> yes, it, it would be useful to receive that sort of information, that performance information to support the, the words that are contained in the, in, in the update. Keith, I couldn't agree with you more, because it, it's all very well me saying something's going okay. If you see the numbers and can satisfy yourself, it's job done, isn't it? Th th thank you. Um, I've just got one quick uh, question. You, you, you alluded to, obviously, in terms of resources, with, the, with HS2 and various other issues within Staffordshire. Um, is the, um, in terms of HS2, does the... Um, Secretary of State for Transport assist policing in this situation through discussions with the Home Office um, because obviously it takes a big, can and does take a big resource to deal with those particular issues and it's the same with the, and I know I draw it to, to Litchfield District but we have the situation at Shenstone with the, um, the, the defence um, um, operations there where we have uh, Palestine liberation people there. Uh, it does take an awful amount of resources that takes it away from those divisions. Do you get support? Um, no, uh, in the sense that um, it's the resources of the service that need to be employed. We've got the um, uh, rolling situation in Shenton and Tamworth where those factories get um, um, uh, vandalised and, and protesters. We've got a protest around a very legitimate concern at Wally's Quarry in Newcastle. That takes a lot of police resource, keeping people safe as much as, as the other uh, concerns. And um, I think with, with HS2 we're going to see more. I'm afraid the national um, full-time protesters see Staffordshire as a, a possible place to spend the summer. Now the good news is the Chief Constable is the National Police Chiefs Council lead for protests. So, if anything, it works the other way around. The, the, um, the national bods will phone our Chief Constable and say, what do you think we should be doing about the oil um, refinery protests at the moment? There's one at Kingsbury just across the border uh, where there's some pretty outrageous behaviour been going on. So, it's, um, we're, in, we're right in the heart of those questions with our chief constable but you're absolutely right if we're policing protests we're not policing something else it's not good I, I couldn't agree more and that's the, the concern that I, I, I have with such significant major projects that are affecting us and uh, it is the policing of elsewhere which draws to my attention um, members, I think we've uh, given uh, the Commissioner a good uh, uh, time there um, on, <laughs> on, on some questioning and um, I think there's a lot that we can take fr from it um, and if I can move on um, to um, number eight, which, is, uh, which I think we may have covered in many ways, questions to the uh, Commissioner by panel members. Um, so again, not to prolong it because I think we've actually rolled the, the, the two uh, in, in, into one, but I, I will open it up um, to two members. Councillor Holmes. Just a quick uh, apologies for leaving the chamber. As most of you will know, I lost my mother last week and that was a call appertaining to that. Thank you. And uh, our deepest sympathies there, um, Mr Holmes, and we can totally uh, respect uh, you leaving the room for a short while. Um, Councillor Edgeley. 
Thank you, Chairman. Well, this is a question I was going to angle over till the next time, but I'll ask it now, now I've got the opportunity. And it's to do the, at the last meeting, this, uh, the fire service is doing a lot of work with the uh, housing associations about fire procedures and that. You know, if you remember, we had a bungalow that caught fire and the fire people, it took them two hours to get hold of the fire people. Uh, and I wonder if... The, it was the housing association's fault. It's not. Uh, I'm not condemning the fire people. Um, has any work taken place regarding that? It was an incident where a bungalow caught fire, and the fire people couldn't get hold of the housing association people for two hours. Do you remember the incident a, few, a couple of months back? And I wondered if any work had been done with the housing association to make sure we're not in the same position again. Commissioner. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of, of any spe anything specifically relating to that, Anne, but I will feed back to you and the panel. Um, they're in constant discussion, especially on shared public buildings, around safety plans. We had a fire in um, Trenton recently, which was, a, I think, a couple of storeys. A building needed to be um, emptied very quickly, and people had, some people had to spend the night elsewhere. So knowing how to access these buildings, what the safety plans are, whether they're in place properly is really important. I'll come back to you about the detail. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Can I just mention, it's actually getting the housing association to have somebody on duty. This happened at the weekend. Yeah. And as I say, they couldn't get hold of anybody at the housing association. And the yeah. bungalow was just burnt out. It's, it's very concerning that we don't get people on duty at the NHS mental health service, and we don't get people on duty at XYZ service as well. And it's... Um, the police, the fire service, they answer the phone and respond. But you're quite right, we need to uh, get to the bottom of that and remember that we were, we're going to do it. We'll come back to you. Thank you. And uh, it's Leslie. Thanks, Chair. Just really a comment around, um, um, around that. Um, um, ben mentioned the fire in Trenton. Um, uh, in Stoke uh, a few weeks back. And obviously, we had the serious case of a leopard fire. And I did send in my apologies, and I, I did read in the minutes that you'd asked to, to thank myself, thanks to the fire brigade for dealing with that leopard fire. But obviously now I'm here in person, I would just like to say that we pass my regards back to the, the fire service for their prompt and absolutely devastating response to the fire at the leopard, the fire at the flats in, in, in Blurton. Thank you, Ben. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I think that rounds up uh, item, item eight. Um, can I now go to the uh, item nine on the agenda, which is dates for future meetings and the work program. Um, I'd like to uh, open with the, um, the during our uh, pre-meeting, there was a, a, a good discussion in terms of actions following our meetings that we have here. And as today we've heard the commissioner make reference that, that he's going to come back to us. Um, Members, I think we probably decide that we will um, certainly follow that uh, up. Um, uh, Mandy will uh, look at the governance and so forth to take it how we do it. Um, at the present moment, we don't have matters arising from minutes, but in terms of actions from the commissioner uh, and actions from any uh, point of view, um, we are keeping tabs on um, to ensure that they are brought back to this panel to ensure that we are doing the job that we are here holding the commissioner to task. Um, members, do you have any wish to add to that particular comment? And I've hopefully have summarised it as well as possible. Okay, I'll take that as, uh, as agreed. Um, so we, we obviously have our um, pro programme. Um, our next um, scheduled meeting will be uh, the Monday, uh, the 27th of June, in, in the papers. You'll have a list of the uh, work programme there. Um, in terms of going forward, um, minding that there are local elections due next week, the composition of the, the, um, this panel may change, may not. Um, so uh, we'll see from there. But any comments on the work programme, members? No, I'll take that as a, as a uh, we're happy with it. And uh, 
I think at that point then I'd like to uh, thank you very much for your attendance and contribution. Thank you to the Commissioner and certainly welcome to, to Louise, to uh, her role as Chief Executive. And uh, thanks to those that may be watching on the uh, webcast. Um, I hope you have a, an enjoyable rest of the day. Enjoy the sunshine and uh, thank you. And I close the meeting at what I see as 12.06. Thank you very much. <laughs>